And we would like to welcome everybody to um, today's forum called Workers Forge the Future, an info session on informal and platform workers in Asia and the Pacific. Of course, we would like to uh, give a warm welcome to the workers, researchers, experts, guests from the APFSD, development workers, and everybody participating in today's event. And of course, I'm uh, gathered here today because of the uh, ongoing, the ongoing um, labor Recording crisis in progress. that we're all experiencing. According to ILO numbers from 2018, the informal sector accounts for over 60% of the world's workforce. And in uh, the A Asia Pacific region alone, this number is about 70% as of 2018. Of course, uh, there are several barriers that prevent people from getting jobs, barriers like uh, contractualization, increasingly unfair and discriminative job requirements, privatization leading to mass layoffs, so on and so forth, that push people, <clears throat> excuse me, that push people to uh, join the informal sector. And of course, if there are jobs available, these jobs don't always pay a livable wage, which is why the allure of uh, flexible work hours and uh, bigger take home pay uh, draws people towards informal work. But of course, uh, informal work doesn't always promise greener pastures. And what is informal work? Uh, it's like setting up a small corner store, selling goods by the sidewalk, offering services like uh, home service massages, manicures, pedicures, or whatnot. Basically, everybody who participates in the uh, gig economy. And of course, as such, it's very precarious. Laws do not protect you. Very little social services are available for these kinds of workers. And in the, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the situation bolstered a very specific variety of workers, and these would be the platform workers. And when we say platform workers, we, we're talking about uh, digital platform workers, the workers of delivery services and whatnot. And of course, despite providing a very vital service, and this was proven during the pandemic, despite providing a very vital service, platform workers and informal workers in general are very much taken advantage of and uh, very rarely uh, respected and given, you know, the, the pay that they deserve. And which is why we are gathered here today to talk about the struggles besetting platform workers and informal workers start off uh today's event we would just like to remind everybody of the house rules for panelists and oh sorry for panelists speakers and hosts first house rule will be as much as possible keep your cameras turned on at all times during the conference mute your microphones unless it is your turn to speak and try to maintain proper framing and lighting for your videos we like we would like everybody to look as handsome or as pretty as possible for this event. Rule number three, for panelists, speakers who will be sharing their presentations, please provide the organizers a copy of your presentation for backup. Number four, when screen sharing during the program, please use full screen slideshow mode. And finally, you may use the chat option to message the organizers for any technical concerns during the conference. By the way, I am JB Sangalang from Kadame National. And uh, our first speaker will be coming up in a bit. Let's uh, welcome our first speaker. Hold on. Okay. Nur Aini or Nora is the chairperson of Sindikasi, the Media and Creative Industry Workers Union in Indonesia. Previously, she worked as a journalist in print and online media for more than a decade and currently continues to work in the media sector as a project officer of an independent media outfit in Jakarta, Indonesia. Sindikasi, or Media and Creative Industry Workers Union for Democracy, is a pioneer initiative collective by workers in the media and creative sector to aim for bargaining power and to become a collective safety net for the precarity under the digital economy. Established on August 27, 2017, Sindikasi now has around 500 members from 20 provinces in Indonesia, most of which are young workers and freelancers. Let's welcome Noor Aini from Sindikasi. 
Thank you, GP Emmanuel. Uh, I have a presentation uh, today. So, but good morning, everybody. I am Nura from Sindikasi, uh, Chairperson of Media and Creative Worker Union in Indonesia, and I'm honored to join this event with you today. And I will uh, present uh, about the condition uh, the platform worker in Indonesia. So. Maybe just go on to the presentation. I will talk about informalization and its impact on platform worker in the media and creative industry, especially, of course, in Indonesia. Next. Okay. First, uh, I will introduce you, uh, Sindikasi. As I like I said, the moderator said that it, Sindikasi is a Pioneer Initiative Collective by Worker. So this is a non-workplace based union. So we are, uh, our member is a union. Uh, our members are worker from across company and profession. So we are not based uh, specifically from uh, one company or others, but we, uh, our member is worker from, across company and it's also including the independent worker or in indonesia they specially call as freelancer or there's some other uh status like like uh you know a partner and sometimes they call as contributor and so on and our members also has a various employment relationship like a permanent contract based freelance consultant partner and so on and also we have inclusive members uh, from lgbtq group from disability minority urban and rural and etc and we focus distant work and gender so our program focus on two uh two issues uh, regarding decent work and gender equality in the world of work. So next, uh, so talking about the platform uh, worker, our members is consists from sixteen subsectors of media and creative industry. They have come from digital application and technology. Of course, this is uh, uh, the majority of from the platform workers come from and visual communication design product design and so on and we are also organizing the platform workers from these 16 subsectors uh you know that internet and also digital platform economy uh bring us a lot new uh employment like uh, it developer and programmer, streamer, UI, UX designer, data analyst, and now we have social media strategists and also social media admin. Uh, and we are also has online media workers, of course, because now media has uh, transformed into media, online media in everywhere. And also we have content creators. Right now it is kind of job for the young worker in Indonesia because uh, they are now not choose to be a worker in, in company or so on, uh, but they they are now uh, an independent, independent worker. Uh, they call as freelancer and they call the profession is content creators. And our members mostly uh, young workers uh, between 20 to 35 years old, so very young. And uh, also we organizing the first time jobber. And we are actually that we are also uh, accept the members from the student in university of that they study from the media and creative, um, maybe like they are from a student from uh, advertising uh, studies or maybe architecture studies and so on. But mostly uh, our members are young workers. And 70% uh, 
their status are freelancer. So this is a trend in young workers in Indonesia that they're now choose to be a freelancing. Uh, they're not only to be freelance in one place, but also for uh, a lot of a lot of uh, client or employer and so on. And we have almost uh, 500 workers in 20 province in Indonesia. And last year we have uh, one branch in Jakarta Greater Area. It's called uh, Sindikasi Jabodetabek. Uh, it is a worker from Jakarta Greater Area. So this is kind of our first branch. Next. And talking about the working condition that platform uh, worker now have to face uh, in syndicacy uh, in twenty uh, in two thousand and twenty one we have research regarding about the gig economy. What is a gig economy? Has uh, there's there's a phenomenon that gig economy transfer employment. So we identify that there is work ecosystem in common that happen in uh, gig economy and impact and, and has impact in platform workers or gig workers. Uh, we call it as a flexible working ecosystem. So this is happening everywhere actually. And we identify that there is a specifically uh, characteristic that work ecosystem in common in in uh, gig economy, uh, such as self employment worker is now has a trend in raising like independent worker right now, especially in the young worker that just to be uh, independent workers. Maybe oh, they, maybe they apply uh, job in the company, but they also accept for the freelancing job. So they have uh, two or more jobs uh, in the uh, same times. And they have flexible work practice. It is not only flexible in the working hours. Uh, this is kind of, you know, something that really attract the young worker to join uh, this status as an indep independent worker because they have flexible working hours. They can work everywhere. They like to work in a cafe uh, or maybe work from home is a kind of trend, especially in the pandemic, of course. And but they also have a casual, you know, a casual uh, contract. Uh, they have no formal contract or written contract to get their job. They only have uh, they get the job by only their, uh, from the message from the WhatsApp or maybe their friend has a job, a uh, kind of that. So this is very flexible and very casual in uh, employment status. And also uh, this independent worker work on demand, especially this is a platform worker that uh, work for uh, specifically a uh, platform industry like uh, you know uh, Goje, uh, Crab. Uh, in Philippines there is a food panda, but in Indonesia Shopee Food, uh, kind of that they work uh, as on demand. But this is not only uh, for the worker that work in the platform uh, company, but also for the uh, creative industry. Uh, they also now work on demand when they uh, work as a freelance because there is a demand to their service and they uh, sell their uh, skill to the client and so on. And uh, work ecosystem that in common also for the independent workers, uh, they get only non permanent work basis. So they have only short term job and maybe not, not only a uh, month or uh, or weeks, but they also have job that counting in hours uh, or maybe uh, only one output or they 
uh, consider as a worker if they can give an output for the specifically client or employer. So next, however, uh, th that uh, condition, that phenomenon has a consequence that this is uh, this consequence uh, sometimes not recognized by the workers or sometimes they just uh, consider it as it is common uh, situation in this era as a platform worker, as a digital worker, uh, they didn't see it as a problem or they didn't see they don't see uh, this is as a violation of the right of the worker so the platform condition uh syndicacy uh the research of the syndicacy uh identify that there is informalization and flexploitation phenomenon in indonesia especially for the independent worker because they also as a inform they also as uh you know kind of recognized as informal worker so flexible working hours also means that they can work long working hours and they have no social protection and they just have low wage and no job security because the job is short term and the contract based and and they just have the contract based worker uh they just only have short term and they can call it a freelancer contributor so there is no formal uh worker status anymore so and how uh they get they right it is uh also the challenge because they cannot organize because they are individual workers so a syndicacy uh has challenged to organize one by one door by door to organize this individual worker so they work as startup and maybe they cannot uh, form the union because they are very uh small people in indonesia we have to have uh 10 people to from the union and also there's no protective regulation because they are unrecognized in the regulation and they have uncertainty and the regulation also make they make them uh have uncertainty about their job and so on so uh in syndicacy we call it that worker experience as Flex exploitation stand for flexibility and exploitation, where the working condition are unsafe, unhealthy working environment, and absent of job certainty and also social protection. Next, uh, maybe this is uh, the last because I just have two minutes. And talking about the challenge of the platform uh, worker is employment status. Uh, recognition of worker status because right now they are in a informal uh, workers some in Indonesia they are not recognized in the regulation pro and protection especially in the social protection and also uh, there is a challenge in, in dispute specialization mechanism is the mechanism sufficient for them if they are uh has this put related to worker right violation is the mechanism sufficient if the worker consider as partner maybe they have no status as a worker so they has no worker right so there is a problem in the dispute resolution mechanism and also about a uh, challenge about decent work including decent wages and working hours and fair termination uh process uh, is there any bargaining right because they have no status as a worker or is there a compensation uh, in the termination process and of course freedom of association uh, because they are very small uh, you know uh, in a group and there is a challenge in transparency and accountability of algorithms algorithm and key performance indicator because we are not supervised by artificial intelligence right so uh this is challenge uh 
to to you know to push the transparency and accountability in a in a you know counting for the weight and and so on and okay so how to challenge uh how to to come the challenge uh and where to start maybe we have to start from the first is redefinition who is the worker uh is the platform worker is the worker because right now we have status as a freelancer status as partner as status as contributors and so on so uh if we are have no status as a worker so we have no right uh, we have no worker right so who is the worker is it someone who get paid but who is paid them because in a platform industry sometimes when uh like you know grab so who paid for the worker the the consumer or the platform industry and how they get paid who is the employer uh what is decent work for platform worker because this is very important to have redefinition because there is a transformation in the production process or production chain so there is a need to redefinition and maybe of course solidarity among platform workers because this is the phenomenon actually happen globally not only specific in Indonesia because platform worker now uh, regardless uh, place and time uh, this is happen everywhere and of course strengthening worker union uh, and also maybe we need a global movement and I am thankful today because we are now start as a global movement actually from the discussion this discussion and we talk about the work condition in our uh specifically uh, country so we can share and maybe have inspired order to uh join uh and make a change i think uh, that's all from me and we if we have should you have any question and uh, we can discuss later thank you Thank you, Nora. And uh, of course, uh, before we move on to the uh, next speaker, uh, I just want to let everybody know that we got to keep working together and empowering groups like Syndicacy, not just because of the help they provide to workers, but because they have studies that more accurately and correctly represent the real conditions of workers on ground. Because as we all know, the numbers very rarely paint a clear, inaccurate picture of what most workers have to go through and uh to talk about the plight of informal workers in india uh varghese Tekanath is the director of monfort institute in india and is part of the international alliance of the inhabitants or iai let us welcome varghese Tekanath from india uh, thank you. Thank you, JB, for this welcome and for this opportunity. Uh, I would uh, request uh, that the slides are shared. Can you share the slides? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about a very major sector of informal workers, not only in, not only in India, but uh, the world over. The domestic workers. I particularly want to take two major sending countries of the world of domestic workers uh, abroad, uh, that is India and the Philippines. Uh, and I shall place this in the context of the realization of the SDGs. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, SDGs, particularly SDG 8, talk about decent work for domestic workers. Now, if we took a look at the context of India, uh, that's a, with a population of 1,400 million people, there are 500 million workers in India, of whom 93% are in the informal sector. Uh, one thing that has been realized year after year is that India is far behind the targets of achieving uh, the SDG targets 
particularly in 12 of the 17 SDGs. Uh, and uh, 8, 9, 11, these are SG, SDGs where India is performing extremely poor uh, when compared to the targets that have been set. Uh, similarly, in uh, uh, in Philippines, uh, we are told that there are 15.68 million workers in all, uh, and uh, I think in both these countries, uh, the targets as far as realizing SDGs for workers, informal workers, is far uh, behind, uh, far behind the requirement. Next, next slide. Yeah. Uh, as of 20, uh, 2023, domestic workers continue to be among the most vulnerable of groups in the unorganized sector across the world, not only in India and in Philippines. Uh, there is very limited legislation. In fact, in Philippines, we do have legislation, but in India, there is very, very limited legislation as far as protection of the rights of domestic workers is concerned. And uh, they uh, being workers within the households, uh, there is uh, a great deal of exploitation that happens. There is, a, especially in the context of uh, uh, economic upheavals like the COVID-19 that we have just passed, uh, domestic workers were among the most to suffer, not only in India, but uh, all over the world. Next. Now, as far as definition of domestic workers is concerned, okay, at the ILO, in uh, Convention 189 on the uh, on decent work for domestic workers, did give a reasonably good definition for domestic workers. Uh, but in India, we st still do not have a legislation that uh, regulate domestic work, uh, and so there is no one definition as far as domestic workers are concerned uh, in the different uh, related acts that uh, include domestic workers. There are differing, differing uh, definitions that are given. While in the Philippines, there is a more definitive uh, definition, uh, what they call the Kassam Bahe, uh, officially defined as any person engaged in domestic work within an employment relationship, whether on a living or live out arrangement, such as but not limited to general house help, cook, gardener, or laundry person but shall exclude family drivers. This is very important. Children who are under foster family arrangement or any person who performs domestic work only occasionally or sporadically, not on an occupational basis. Uh, this is a, a, a lot more better definition in India. Next. Now, as far as the numbers of domestic workers, the official estimate, we do not have the actual numbers of domestic workers in India. The official estimate is that there must be 30 million domestic workers, uh, but organizations like, uh, like ours that work with the domestic workers uh, is of the uh, serious opinion that uh, there must be between 40 to 60 million domestic workers in India. Uh, while in Philippines, it is estimated that 1.9 million domestic workers work within the country, and there is perhaps an estimated uh, 2.87 million domestic workers who work outside the country. Next. Uh, now, if you look at uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, positions as far as the conditions of work is concerned, uh, now, when we take contracts, uh, whether domestic workers enter into a contract with their employer, uh, 90, in India, 95% do not have a written contract with their employers. And in Philippines, it is even higher. 97.5% we are told do not have the written contract in spite of its requirement by law, because in Philippines, there is a law that legislates, regulates it. As far as social security is concerned, domestic workers do not, in India, domestic workers do not have any social security benefits. Uh, but a large number of benefits from one or other schemes uh, that is open to all informal workers uh, are also accessed by domestic workers in India. Uh, while 12.75% uh, of the domestic workers in India do not have any type of social security. 
while in, uh, uh, in the Philippines, 83% do not benefit from any social security, we are told. Uh, minimum wages, 77.3% of domestic workers receive minimum wage in India. While in Philippines, uh, in the national capital region, domestic workers receive perhaps a marginally higher uh, wage than uh, the nationally stipulated minimum wage. And weekly day off in India, 70.5% of domestic workers do not have a weekly day off. And in the Philippines, 36% of domestic workers do not have a weekly day off. Next. Next slide, okay. Now, as far as the existing legislation for domestic workers is concerned, there is current in India, there is currently no national policy, leave alone a legislation that regulate domestic workers. Uh, but there are uh, at least three uh, existing labor legislations that uh, legislations that include domestic workers in some form. While in the Philippines, we do have a comprehensive national legislation uh, that was introduced uh, and is called the Domestic Workers Act. Uh, so, so that is as far as legislation uh, that regulates domestic work and domestic workers are concerned. Uh, next, next slide. Yeah, uh, in India, for instance, uh, uh, the legislations where domestic workers are included is the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act to 2008. This includes domestic workers. There is the sexual harassment that workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act of 2013 uh, this after a great deal of struggle in fact the domestic workers were not uh, included in this uh, when it was introduced in parliament as a bill but then the domestic workers organizations had to fight through to get domestic workers included into it uh, and then 11 out of 29 states in india uh, include domestic workers in the schedule of minimum wages act uh, while in the Philippines, as I already said, the Domestic Workers Act of 2013, uh, which is uh, we have, by our standards in India, we have found this a, a reasonably good act if that is implemented. Uh, the next slide. Uh, now, as far as rati ratification of uh, ILO Convention 189, because this is the convention that was adopted in 2011 on 16 June uh, to protect uh, domestic workers and call the decent work for domestic workers. Uh, as far as India is concerned, India was uh, India did sign the ILO Convention 189 on domestic workers in 2011, but it has not still ratified uh, simply because there is no domestic law that regulate domestic work in India. While in the Philippines in September 2012, the Philippine government uh, uh, ratified ILO Convention 189. I think Philippines was one of the first countries to ratify Convention 189. Next. Uh, now, in terms of recommendations, uh, both uh, one is that we, in both these countries, in India and in Philippines, we still do not have a definitive uh, uh, statistics, data on who do, uh, how many domestic workers there are, because that is important for policy, for regulation. Uh, working conditions of domestic workers, both in India and Philippines, still need to be, uh, still is far from what is desirable. Uh, social security, uh, Again, this is not something that is still not implemented, even if, even though it is there, a legislation is there in Philippines, uh, it is not implemented. In India, there is again a legislation, but it is still far from uh, being implemented. Uh, so in terms of recommendations in India, it is very, very important that India ratifies ILO Convention 189 uh, by adopting a national legislation. This is a condition uh, in India. Uh, as far as ratification of uh, international conventions are concerned. Uh, as promised by the government of India, proper implementation and legislation enacted for domestic workers. Uh, in fact, this is necessary in both countries. Uh, implementation, as I said. Uh, in India, there is a very serious uh, uh, effort to change the labor laws uh, 
in tune with uh, opening the economy, liberalization, and that has impacted workers uh, very seriously. Uh, 29 of the labor laws uh, have been put into for labor courts, and often the domestic workers is not present in these laws definitively. Now, this is a matter of grave concern in India, uh, especially given the large number of domestic workers who are women workers. In fact, in the urban sector, domestic workers form the second largest uh, uh, working workers sector in India after the construction workers. So uh, not being domestic workers, not being included definitively with their own, with the uh, necessary regulation and legislation is a very big concern as far as women workers are concerned and in general workers are concerned. Uh, next slide. That's my last slide. Uh, in conclusion, both the India and Philippines, as most other developing economies in the world, are dependent on informality among its workforce. And the workforce is increasingly becoming informalized. Globalization and liberalization of the economy have made the situation of informal workers a lot worse than perhaps what it was earlier, at least in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of uh, implementation, in terms of redressal mechanisms. Uh, this was particularly visible during the COVID-19 pandemic, and many of you who are in the audience would have seen millions and millions of informal workers traveling thousand kilometers, walking, literally walking thousands, thousand, thousand, three hundred, thousand, five hundred kilometers to reach their homes. And when they came back, not finding work. In other words, COVID uh, situation was a terrible situation as far as uh, migrant workers in India were concerned. Millions of migrant workers in India were concerned. Uh, and their situation has not still improved, even though the economy in India is fast catching up uh, to pre-COVID uh, times but then the situation of workers have not improved really. If decent work and inclusive development as envisaged in SDG 8, 9, and 11 needs to be achieved, governments have to show far more resolve to provide regulatory and implementation mechanisms on the one hand, and monitoring and redressal measures. Uh, so this is very, very important. If we are to seriously look at uh, uh, look at the situation of domestic workers uh, and informal workers in achieving SDG goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Varghese, for that uh, very insightful uh, presentation. And it makes you sad and angry how systematic the oppression is of informal workers, despite them being essential workers. And this is evidenced by the lack of statistics, because when they're underrepresented in statistics by the government, it gives the government a reason uh, for them to not represent this certain demographic in legislation. And uh, it's very, um, it's a very sad reality. But of course, continued collaboration between countries will help defeat a common enemy, because of course, despite being in different places, it's almost startling how similar the experiences are from informal workers everywhere. And uh, one of the most, um, uh, shall we say, oppressed uh, demographic of informal workers are people with disabilities. So to, to speak on issues of PWD informal workers in, Asia, in Pacific Islands, we have Ms. Liza Veretti from the Fiji Islands, who is the Director of Operations of the Pacific Disability Forum. Lisa provides oversight and manages the organization's programs, operations, and manages external partnership. Pacific Disability Forum is a consti consti constituency of 71 organizations of and for persons with disabilities and individual members representing diverse groups of persons with disabilities. They currently have supporters in 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. And let's welcome Ms. Liza Veretti. Thank you, JV. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Chair, for those uh, kind words of introduction. 
pleasure to share on the platform around the issues of uh, of informal workers in the Pacific. I guess for us as persons with disabilities, uh, finding job in itself is, is difficult in the first place, whether it's a formal sector or informal sector, but specifically to the informal sector, there are a number of issues that we need to, uh, to be talking about or to be addressing. Um, and uh, some of those that I'd like to share and speak to this afternoon. Across the Pacific Island countries, um, if you talk about informal workers or informal work for persons with disabilities, a lot of it is confined to their own work home environment. It's a home environment at home because of the issues around accessibility. Uh, the accessibility issues and because they are much more comfortable to their to their environment and at home they are familiar with so a lot of the informal work will be around starting or running their small business to earn an income which is based from home outside home we are well aware that one the environment is not accessible uh, our road is not accessible there's no accessible transportation and, um, and, and other spaces where accessibility is needed. So even if we talk about formal employment, one of the things that we advocate for as a constituency of persons with disabilities in the Pacific would be, we look first and we talk about our precondition to inclusion. The inclusion to be able to participate and be included, whether it's at the workspace for employment or whether it's education or whether it's accessing services so one of those one of the six precondition to our inclusion would be accessibility and that would mean accessibility to build environment we talk about building parks market uh, roads airport jetties wharves accessibility to transportation uh, to leave their home so even if they are if they find work elsewhere, they still need to leave home in an accessible public transportation, which is not accessible. And accessibility to information, communication, and technology. I just want to focus, focus and delve a little into the accessibility component, linking it to informal work. In this, in this case, in the space of informal work of persons with disabilities operating from home operating from home. They do that one because outside their home the environment is not accessible. Okay? The other issues would be around, um, apart from the accessibility, would be the limited capacity to, to be able to advertise their informal business on through social media platform. One would be the issues on internet connectivity second would be affordability of internet third would be affordability of um, of mobile phones if they need to use that to advertise their informal business because when we talk about the groups of persons with disabilities we are, there are various groups those with visual impairment whether they are blind or low vision at all totally and then we talk about those groupings with physical disabilities, those who use this mobility device, whether they use a wheelchair or crutches or walkers or other forms of physical disability that will that the physical environment does not allow them to access spaces easily. Then you have those with a hearing impairment, deaf. So even if they work outside their homes, uh, are sign language interpreters available? For them to be able to uh, to find jobs or even uh, at the informal workspace and then peer support personal assistance so some of these are a hindrance for them to leave their home because of accessibility but also because of the support that is available so if we're talking about informal working space or informal work for persons with disabilities in the pacific a lot of them are confined to running a small business from home running a small business from home because that's their environment at home is a lot more accessible and they have adapted their homes to suit them to make it accessible for them um, um, and if i give you example of uh, running their small business it could be running a small canteen from home 
or, or it could be selling uh, vegetables from in front of the home or a roadside market or it can be baking that can be sold um, from home so these are the the reasons why the 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 space okay i like the previous uh, speaker that talked about the domestic work one of the reasons uh, we persons with disabilities we do not venture into domestic work largely because of the stigma tied around disability and the, and the barriers to be able to leave home and work elsewhere so largely around attitude attitude of the community attitude of the society attitude of organization and, and attitude of institutions themselves so attitude the other one is barriers and the accessibility the, the the platform here or the side event this afternoon is also to discuss like uh, what are what are areas of support in terms of social protection post covid if you work in the informal sector we know that you don't have any social security there's nothing like that unless you operate or you run your business as a cooperative um, there might be something that would be available for you but social protection largely post covid for persons with disabilities in the pacific was largely around cash transfer which is um, totally independent and nothing to do with social security it was part of the response and and recovery and recovery for covid uh, direct cash transfer uh, so food supplies clothing supplies uh, farming supplies so it was those one of payments it was simply one of payments as part of recovery and response post covid but if we talk about uh, the larger social protection programs that comes out of governments i guess for us a lot would be whether whether you are in the formal working sector or you operate as a small business from home it differs by countries okay it differs by countries what governments offers and it depends on what is the purpose of the social protection program for example for fiji cash transfer is um, is designed to support the extra cost of disability which would mean if you're working or if you do not work or you're in the informal sector you are eligible to receive cash transfer that's for fiji in other countries it's designed to substitute income that means if you are a person with disability and you are in the formal working space then you're not eligible to receive the cash allowance because you're already working um, so it depends largely on how on how the social protection program is designed to cover to fulfill if it's to cover the extra cost of disability then anybody can receive it regardless whether you are working or you are not or you are in the informal space you're still eligible if it's designed uh, to replace income then if you're working you will not get it it's only for those who are not working um, so social protection post covid applies to everybody in terms of cash transfer in terms of food supplies in terms of household supplies including economic empowerment and seed funding that comes with training and seed funding so those would be the the issues of informal work in the pacific for persons with disability largely operating from home running small business because they have adjusted we have adjusted our home to make it accessible for us the other issues is trying to advertise it on social media platform but then you have the the limitation of uh, internet accessibility of affordability and availability we on the other end of uh, of social protection as post recovery to covid then that is applied to everybody regard regardless whether you're in the formal working space or you're in the informal working space and then countries as specific social protection program that have that that serves different purposes uh, to substitute income or to pay for your extra cost of uh, of disability i'll i'll stop here um chair and happy to take questions later on thank you um thank you miss uh lisa for your uh 
uh, presentation on the challenges faced by um, persons with disabilities. And, uh, you know, development that does not take into account persons with disability disabilities is, is not real development. It, it is a form of development that excludes, and we cannot have that. And uh, despite there being groups that governments could consult with, uh, it seems as if there's still an ongoing uh, neglect of uh, persons with disabilities. And uh, it's, uh, it's almost incredible how in the year 2023, we still have to deal with these problems when there have been many advancements in all aspects of life that are, are geared towards making it easier for people with disabilities. You can't just throw money at the problem and think that's all people with disabilities need. They need access to jobs and access in general, access period. So, um, I guess at this point, it's time to move on to um, our um, reactor. Here to uh, share some uh, thoughts and uh, reactions on the previous speakers is Shigeru Tanaka, who is the executive director of the Pacific Asia Resource Center, or the PARC. PARC is a people's think tank based in Tokyo, Japan. They work to connect various social movements committed to international social and economic justice. So let us all welcome Shigeru Tanaka. Hey, thank you very much for that introduction, JV. My name is Shigeru Tanaka, based in Tokyo for an organization called PARC. And um, so I was just listening to the three um, presentations right now. And one thing that um, I want to point out is that um, with our third speaker, she mentioned about a case where when um, people with disabilities, when they are employed, then just because of that status, some um, people lose their access to benefits, for example. And I think that it's a, a very clear example of how our society tries to um, divide people in a very binary way in terms of employment, whether you are employed or whether you are not. And that causes frictions for people who don't neatly fit within these boxes, so to say. And so when we have these platform apps or um, access to work through um, mobile, and I know there are difficulties in accessing through mobile as well, but we understand that for some people, it gives opportunities and empowers people to access things that they um, would not be able to do otherwise. That said, um, within my field of research, we are actually seeing um, big corporations who are trying to exploit the need for these kind of non-binary solutions to employment or work. And that is, um, for example, what I see is in the case of the big rideshare uh, platform apps. And um, what we are seeing is that these companies, they would come in and say that they are offering these new opportunities, flexibilities, as the first speaker has said. But what in reality, what they are doing is actually abusing the need for such non-binary solutions. And they are abusing the system whereby they claim that the people who work on these platforms are not normal employees because they chose to be that way. And we did a study across um, various countries within Southeast Asia um, with um, India, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, um, Cambodia. And what we found was that across the board, these large rideshare applicant apps that try to abuse this system, they would give a very good offer at first to lure workers into that freedom and the choice to work. But then actually when they have basically decimated the competition would reduce the wages to roughly about 40% or less of the initial wages. 
and it's not even actually wages because they don't they're not waged labor, but it is across the board. And at the same time, they say that they are not employing these people, so they don't have to pay taxes, but they don't have to pay social insurance. And these are the way that they abuse the system. And it's across the board. And why is it across the board? Why is it that these rideshare apps that are different, well, some operate across countries, but many are different. So we have Ola in India, we have Gojek in Indonesia, we have Grab and we Uber for one time in the Philippines, but they all do the same thing. And why is it was one of the questions that we had. And what turns out is that um, we were actually finding out who was behind all these companies. And what we found out was that a Japanese investor of SoftBank Vision Fund, they are investing in all of these. And they are the primary investor in rideshare apps and also food delivery apps in Southeast Asia. And they are not the majority owners of all these companies, so they don't surface. But they, are, they hold about 13% of voting power in all of these companies. And they're working as the fixers with behind these rideshare apps to try to adjust the way that rideshare platforms are operating in all these different countries. Um, and so what we really need to understand is that there are these nefarious actors who cross borders and try to influence societal systems. And we as civil society, like we are doing today, need to share our experiences, come together and really have a united front against the abuse of these systems that are there. And to point out just one more thing, if I may, I know I should cut my thing. Um, the primary investor behind SoftBank Vision Fund actually is Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, GFI. <laughs> so this is essentially Jamal Khashoggi's uh, killer's money. It's Mohammed bin Salman. So people who are notorious for abusing human rights are in fact behind the investments that are destroying laborers' rights in Southeast Asian countries. And we really need to have a united front to fight this kind of abuse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. And uh, that uh, that uh, the last uh, slide that you shared that really uh, perfectly sums up why all of the problems that all these countries, all these people, all these people in these very very different lines of work that encapsulates why their experiences are similar because they're all oppressed by basically a small group of a couple of rich people and. Uh, it makes you want to feel disheartened, but at the same time, like I said previously, constant collaboration among countries is how we defeat the common enemy. And uh, to welcome our um, next, well, I'll welcome the next uh, uh, reactor. His name is Julius Kainglet from the Federation of Free Workers in the Philippines and also an ITUC affiliate. Julius represents the APR CEM workers constituency. So let us all welcome the next reactor, Julius Kenglet. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, JV. I really wanted to have caught you much earlier, but um, well, I would have provided a, a perspective coming from the International Labor Organization, but obviously I cannot do that since I'm not from the office, but one thing we really do have to realize is that uh, we are the ILO. No? So the ILO among the UN agencies is the only specialized agency which does not only have government as its members. So while government is a member, equally and with the same rights as members of the ILO are employers on the one hand and workers on the other. So that puts the, the ILO at a very uh, distinct position where it can um, facilitate the full recognition of rights of workers. 
And I want to relate that no, to, to the discussions that we've had so far. Um, of course, uh, for most of uh, uh, the region, uh, work such as work from uh, such as uh, working from your homes, uh, domestic work, and uh, gig economy work, uh, these are largely classified as being part of the informal workers and uh, looking at uh, grab riders and other gig economy workers. You know, the, the problem is that the, the lines defining employer-employee relationship has really been blurred. You know? So um, if these workers, even if they are workers by definition, are not defined based on having an employer and employer relationship, then a lot of the regulation that comes with protecting workers' rights become absent or become inaccessible to these workers who in the first place are most in need of having or getting their rights recognized. So this is where the ILO comes in because of the normative framework that it brings with it. So uh, for example, we've been lobbying for decades to get the recognition of domestic workers as workers. And then finally in 2012, we were able to uh, come up with Convention 189 on decent work for domestic workers. So uh, it's a result of many, uh, many years of attempts at getting informal work uh, get recognized. So now we have a framework of uh, Convention 189 that provides domestic workers in particular the right to organize, which is also embodied in ILO Convention 87, and the right to just uh, mm -hmm. wages, the right to social protection, things that they weren't enjoying before. So I think we have to, to follow the same track no, when it comes to, to trying to promote the, the rights of gig economy workers. Uh, first and foremost, what we have to realize, especially, is that they have the right to organize, no? and we can help in organizing them. Uh, one thing about membership to the ILO is that as a state, by mere membership to the International Labor Organization, it means that you recognize the fundamental principles and rights at work, which, among others, includes the right to organize and to bargain collectively. So there are five teams all in all. Um, some deal with anti-forced labor, anti-child labor, anti-discrimination, occupational safety and health. But I think the, really, the, the, the most important fundamental right as defined uh, is uh, the right to freedom of association and collective bargaining. And we really have to assert this right. And what I do want to share is that um, we, we, have to, we have to test, we have to continually test the right to organize to make sure that it works. No? Um, for example, uh, in the Philippines where I'm from, uh, at the Federation of Free Workers, it was unthinkable before uh, to get uh, delivery riders organized and more importantly to get them a good collective bargaining agreement that will provide them standards for wages, benefits and all. No? And uh, there was a lot of challenge with our own highest court of the land at the Supreme Court where um, since employers or the owners of these app-based applications have been asserting that they deal not with workers that they hire, but with independent contractors. So this had to be challenged. So we challenged it at two fronts. At the legal system, we had it challenged. And we did the practical thing of actually organizing these gig economy workers. And we are happy to say that we were uh, fortunate enough uh, and lucky that with the challenge that we had and with the, uh, with the acceptance, I mean, of the challenge by the gig workers, the gig economy workers themselves, we were able to successfully organize one, especially for the uh, JNT Express. So, well, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be easy, I assure you. Uh, it's gonna be rocky at the start because when we tried organizing these JNT workers, 
which includes uh, sorters in the warehouses, the drivers of the big delivery trucks that bring the products to the warehouse, which eventually get distributed uh, to the riders, we will really encounter a lot of resistance because employers who are emboldened, who are who are so emboldened because of the support that the government gives them, and who have no who have no conscience at all, and doesn't hide their 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 corporate greed. They will do anything no, to, to make sure that they discourage workers from organizing. So they could go the route of convincing workers that, oh, we are we are friends. Why do you have to unionize? Or to the extent that they want to buy off these workers who want to get themselves organized. Or the extremes, of course, would be to threaten them you know, or, or to frighten them that they will be charged, that they will be that they will be fired from work because of joining unions, which they actually did. So this is one thing that we will really have to face. There will be a lot of resistance from employers when we try to assert our rights. But luckily, uh, we had a, a nice group of people who recognized their right and, and recognized that if they don't unionize, they will only make the situation worse for them and will also make the situation worse for other workers who will get into their present job. So we have to assert a right. Uh, all of us uh, workers in the Asia Pacific, by mere membership to the ILO, are, are, are supposed to recognize ILO Convention 87 on the right to freedom of association. So let's organize, let's organize, let's organize. Let's unionize and bargain collectively. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Julius Kainlet, for uh, your uh, very uh, empowering words. And uh, and like he said, um, there will be resistance, but ultimately, at the end of the day, without the workforce, all countries will grind to a halt. So we always will have the leverage, which is why we have to tirelessly organized, which is why we have to fearlessly unionize. Because again, without the people doing these essential jobs, it would be almost impossible to uh, exist. And uh, at this point, I believe it is time for our open forum and Q&A, which I believe is uh, about 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions or inquiries and whatnot, now is the time to present them to, uh, to our um, speakers and uh, guests. Uh, can I, uh, JV, there is a question in the chat box. There is a question in the chat box for me. Can I okay. respond? Yeah, to that? sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question that is asked is, uh, thank you so much for your great presentation with facts and figures. Do you have analysis on intersectionalities? that is Dalits and other marginalized in informal sector. I would appreciate if you could uh, provide the status, if any. In fact, we did uh, a study of uh, domestic workers in 11 uh, districts of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. These are two states uh, in the southern, uh, two southern states of India. Uh, and then we really wanted to find out uh, uh, what's the number uh, or what percentage of domestic workers from the marginalized sections are actually employed in the domestic workers sector. And our finding was that uh, almost 50%, that is in the towns that where we worked, about 50% of the workers came from what we call the backward classes, uh, which is uh, uh, perhaps the largest percentage of uh, population in the, in the caste uh, system. 
the largest uh, percentage of people, uh, almost 50% of the domestic workers we found in these towns where we surveyed that they came from the backward classes. Uh, we found almost 30% who came from the Dalit communities. And the Dalit communities are among the most backward uh, groups that fall outside the caste system. Uh, formerly, they were called the untouchables. Uh, almost 30% of the domestic workers came from this particular communities. Uh, and we found around 10% of the workers came, came from the, the Adivasi, that is the, uh, the original uh, people of uh, the indigenous people of uh, India, almost 10% of the workers from, came from these communities. And uh, the rest 10% came, uh, uh, came from other communities. Uh, so this, in other words, uh, there seem to be uh, social backwardness and informal employment, especially in the most uh, marginalized and most vulnerable community, vulnerable type of work, or a vulnerable type of uh, uh, labor is, uh, or there's a very high percentage of people who come from the socially backward communities that take these positions. And I think this is a, a finding that runs across all sectors. For instance, uh, some of the uh, some of the sectors like uh, uh, garbage collection, sanitation work, uh, still manual scavenging existing in India, and all these uh, the people who work in these sectors are perhaps among uh, from among the most most uh, uh, backward uh, uh, social groups uh, that uh, are there. So this is something I think there is a a big relationship between uh, informality and the worst forms of informality and social classes. I I hope I uh, I have been able to answer question that has been asked. So to, um, to everyone uh, unable to read the chat box, if anyone has a question, just please click the raise hand button or you can drop it into the uh, chat box. future and we intend to have a a series of uh events in the next few months and this is one of these are a workers caravan a people's caravan across asia pacific so to all the main speakers is there a way that we can visit your countries and integrate among those workers and foster some transnational solidarity and learning and would you be open to be part of that thank you Oh yeah, sure. I think this is uh, the international solidarity. I think has become absolutely necessary when we talk of the rights of workers uh, today and in the future. So I think this is a very important uh, and very interesting initiative that you are taking. We would certainly be uh, would love to be part of that. Would anybody else like to answer the question? I think that's it. Uh, there's another there's question. Another, there's another question in the chat from Iggy for Nura. Yeah, yeah, I was about to get to that. Another question from Iggy for Nora. What are examples of key performance indicators and how is artificial intelligence involved in this? Yeah, uh, the answer for this question. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Iggy. Uh, right now, especially for the application-based worker, uh, the performance, the performance for the workers 
especially depend on how they uh, perform in the application, like uh, how they can uh, in a day, how can they deliver or uh, kind of that. And then uh, when they not deliver on time or maybe uh, there is a glitch in a, a artificial intelligence, they, they uh, can lose their job uh, because uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, system that work for the worker that only uh, artificial intelligence knows about that. Uh, like, you know, uh, in Indonesia, especially for the driver and also uh, for the uh, food delivery uh, worker, they have to deliver uh, on time, uh, like 10 minutes, uh, they have to click on the order, uh, accept the order, and uh, they have only maybe less from than 10 minutes. If they, Recording stopped. Uh, if they uh, not Recording accept, in progress. The, accept the order, uh, more than 10 minutes, they can lose their job, uh, and it, it will, uh, you know, consider as you're not a good worker. Uh, it is kind of... of you know, common issues in Indonesia, for especially for the application uh, worker. And for the, uh, also we have experience from the creative industry worker. Uh, right now, when they are work in, from home, uh, they have to, you know, uh, have, you know, a kind of application that, surveillance surveillance uh, application for surveillance how you work um, if you maybe go to the toilet they will know that you're not work uh, in front of the laptop and sometimes uh, if you leave uh, the laptop in the you know uh, ideal position they you will consider as not work uh, this is a common issue in Indonesia because if you are not comply for the artificial intelligence system, you will consider as a not good worker and will impact to your weights, impact to your relationship, uh, relation, uh, employment relation uh, status. Uh, you can lose your job because you cannot comply for the uh, artificial intelligence system. I think uh, that's uh, what happened in Indonesia. I hope it's answered your question. Thank you, Ms. Nora. And uh, at this point, we would have to close the uh, open forum unless anybody else has a final question. Uh, going once, going twice, and I believe that was the last question. Thank you to all the uh, the guests and speakers, and uh, thank you to everybody who uh, asked a question during our open forum. And up next will be the synthesis and closing remarks to be delivered by somebody from ILO. Iggy Sandrino is an, is an artist and a labor rights defender advocating for trade union rights. He currently serves as the Education Committee Head of the Ecumenical Institute for Labor Education and Research based in the Philippines and a member of APRN. He has experience in organizing workers and has also helped publish research on labor situations and educational materials for unions. Iggy graduated cum laude from the University of the Philippines with a degree in fine arts. Let us welcome Iggy Sandrino. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you again to all the organizers for providing the space to talk about this very important uh, issue. Uh, thank you as well to all the speakers for sharing uh, such wonderful presentations uh, to provide us of what the situation looks like uh, in your respective countries and also painting as a uh, 
a picture as well of uh, what it's like in the region. Um, so for Nora of Sindikasi, uh, she discussed flexible labor, informalization, uh, the phenomenon of the so-called flexploitation, uh, characterized by unsafe and unhealthy workplace environment, uh, with working hour arrangements that are not favorable to workers, uh, but are often overlooked as labor rights violations. Informal and uh, platform workers also face challenges on the exercise of their mm -hmm. freedom of expression, uh, uh, freedom of association, and uh, their right to organize. There is a widening gap in terms of policy coherence, universal social protection, security of tenure, access to social services, and most especially on the decent work agenda, which uh, as they are denied the recognition of worker status. Uh, Varghese also noted that recognition of domestic work as work is a continuing demand to this day. And he emphasized that lack of regulation that advances the rights of domestic workers still persists. And if there are existing policies, they remain limited to just a subsector of those who uh, perform domestic work, such as in the case of India and the Philippines. Case in point, uh, even with the ratification of ILO Convention 189, uh, the gap in national law still remains unaddressed. Similarly, Julius from the Workers' Constituency of APRCM pointed out the influence of the ILO as the specialized UN agency that deals with fundamental freedoms of the workers. Uh, Liza spoke on the interlinkages of domestic and global issues of, of accessibility for informal workers with disabilities, linking the issues of PWDs and informal work that Liza and Varghese uh, discuss to the challenges raised by Nura, the lack of public infrastructure combined with limited capacities to digitally connect, um, the affordability of the internet and mm -hmm. costs of mobile phones, all of these hinder groups with disabilities to promote and mainstream uh, their work, even with the rise of the gig economy. So, with all of that, a question begs to be answered. Where do we start? Um, Nura's recommendations, as well as the studies and proposals of various Asia-Pacific civil uh, society organizations on the recognition of worker status and recognition of workers' rights remain valid and critically important in these times. And the changing nature of work due to the so-called Industry 4.0 and neoliberal globalization. Now, platform workers' issues, similarly to the overarching uh, issues of informal workers and of the domestic workers in the Asia and Pacific, must be linked to the global issues of income inequality, precarious work, and lack of employment opportunities, let alone decent work with living wages. The use of digital platforms has allowed for faster and wider transactions between uh, businesses and consumers with online-based corporations, such as what Shigeru uh, has shown us a while ago. Well, they, they're raking in billions of dollars in profits amid a devastating pandemic and an economic crisis. Finally, as a region, pe peoples in the Asia Pacific still need to demand the ratification of ILO conventions and the adoption of legally binding mechanisms and still strongly demand national policies to resonate the fundamental freedoms of workers and the working people. To change the system and effectively address the systematic, systematic barriers that face us, uh, Shigeri made a really important point that multinational corporations dominate the platform uh, industry and has also resulted in the informalization of work. 
Even worse, people who are notorious in terms of human rights violations are behind the financing and investments of apps and digital platforms, disregarding our fundamental freedoms and are likewise attacking our rights to data privacy and digital justice. With such exploitative conditions, resistance is inevitable. Uh, Julius's success story on organizing platform workers could also serve as inspiration that workers and trade unionists continue to play a vital role in linking the struggles of the workers in the formal economy and the informal workers uh, and workers with disabilities. It is a testament to the historical role of trade unions resisting exploitation and neoliberal globalization and achieving victories in advancing labor rights. Civil society and people's movement must unite to challenge the multinational corporations and demand accountability from member states and governments. Labor advocates, associations, and unions must continue to fight for humane working conditions amid digitization and struggle to make technology genuinely serve mankind. So to effectively change the system, the peoples of the Asia Pacific region must shift the power. So power to the working people. Thank you. Thank you, Iggy, and power to the people indeed. And uh, again, we would like to take all the participants, all the guests, all the workers, all the researchers, the main speakers. We would like to thank everybody involved in uh, today's event. And uh, right now we have a, a photo op session for everybody who would like to take some photos or I guess a screenshot, go uh, strike your most beautiful pose for a couple of photos. I'll take the screenshot, JV. I got you, bro. Open your cameras. One more. In a count of one, two, three. All right, and another. Now let's chant everybody. The people united will never be defeated. The people, the people united, united, united will never, will be, never defeated. be defeated. Again, the people united will never, will never be, defeated. be defeated. The people, the people united, 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 united will never be defeated. defeated. Long live international solidarity. No, All right. Thank everybody. I'll give it to JV and then wrap it up. And, uh, again, despite having a, a seemingly insurmountable battle right in front of us, a continued international solidarity is the only way to defeat this uh, common enemy, and uh, and it's been um, it's been proven in history that working together ultimately um, forces the uh, powers that be to yield to the demands of the people who ultimately have the leverage in society. So once again, thank you to everybody involved. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, and I hope everybody has a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Malam, <laughs> Cecilia. <laughs>